of psychology and pop culture had a baby, they'd call it Shrink Tank. Shrink tank. A new paper reveals more intelligent people are quicker to learn and unlearn. 90% chance that there's some like, weird animal out there. Alan yeah. Stern's been doing this forever. And far more extreme. From Nashville and Charlotte, this is the Shrink Tank Podcast. Welcome, welcome, everybody, and thanks for joining us. I'm Dave Verhagen in Nashville. We have a great show for you guys, and our trending topic today is going to be the year in review. We'll talk about that later. But first, let's meet our Charlotte panel. With us in Charlotte is Dr. Emma Kate Wright. Emma Kate, how are you? Hi, I'm doing very well today. And tomorrow, all you guys have rented an entire theater to see Star Wars. Are you personally excited about it? Oh, yeah. No, it's going to be awesome. I can't wait. Yep. Do you have guests coming and... I, I do. I do. I have some some professional friends and um, other friends. So it's just going to be a good time. It's going to be awesome. Awesome. Frank Gaskell is also here. Dr. Frank Gaskell is with us. And Frank, um, I'm wondering, are you excited about seeing the new Star Wars movie? I'm about ready to black out. <laughs> Absolutely black out. And Dave, you know, you've been to these before where we take a oh, whole I love theater them. over. It's well, one of my favorite things. This year is going to be a little different because we managed to get the biggest theater which is 269 tickets. And I usually leave out about 25 tickets so nobody has to sit in the front row. This year, out of that 269, we have four left. Oh, man. It's going to be packed. That's awesome. So um, any special planning or programming or anything going on to that? No, we're, we're having a little holiday party, um, and then uh, we're going to head on over, watch the movie. And I'll say a few words, and then we're going to come right back to the shop and hang out and process. Very good. Jonathan Hederley is also here. He's our certified Asian who rounds out the panel. And Jonathan, I should know this, but are you, are, for real, are you excited about the Star Wars event? I am excited on behalf of my colleagues, but unfortunately, I will not be able to attend this year's Star Wars what? premiere. What? Yep. My oldest daughter's, her high school choir is singing the national anthem at the Charlotte Hornets game that evening. Thus, I have a conflict that we are all very torn uh, uh, about um, missing it. Um, So, and I'll tell you what, by the time we realized the dates overlapped, it's like four or five days before I can find tickets uh, for a showing. So... That's going to be really hard for me after it's out to not read all of the commentary and reviews because I I haven't had to worry about that the last few years. I've seen it the opening night, and then I can read all the the critiques and analyzing the film. Hey, Dave, when will you be seeing it? Same time you are at uh, 7 o'clock on Friday night. We have 60 tickets. Sweet. We don't have the whole theater, but we have a block of 60 uh, for everybody that— works here and friends and some family and things like that. So this is the first year, like this is, this is a tradition since these new star Wars movies, since the JJ Abrams one came out, we've, this is the third year in a row where we've gotten the whole theater and brought everybody. It's actually one of my highlights of the year. So I'm really bummed that I'm going to miss it, but I'm, I'm very much looking forward to doing this in Nashville and having our crew here. So it's going to be cool. Well, Dave, Uh, you know, you, you are, invited to come to the Charlotte Hornets game with me if you <laughs> don't have anything going on that Friday evening. Well, thank you. I, I, I don't think I'll take you up on it. And Jonathan, you scour the internets, the World Wide Web, all of that every week for great stories about psychology and pop culture for our first segment that we call Being Human. A new study has been released that compared the performances of elite male and female tennis players. And what they found was men were more likely to buckle under pressure during tense match moments. They discovered that while male players made more unforced errors at pivotal points during their matches, the women's responses varied more. And one possible possible explanation they cited was cortisol levels, the stress hormone and 
it tends to increase more rapidly in men than in women in such scenarios ranging from golf to public speaking, and that those spikes can hurt performance. So, Emma Kate, as the superior gender on this panel, do you buy these findings? Um, I actually think this is interesting. So, when you think about from an evolutionary perspective, how people have evolved in terms of gender to handle stress, this is kind of tapping into that a little bit where men have this higher cortisol response, which is that stress hormone that initiates and helps engage the fight or flight response. So for those who aren't aware of fight or flight being, if you were to see a bear in the woods, you would either fight the bear to try and survive or run as fast as you could to, to make sure you, you, you lived. Um, but there's also for women, there's some research that's come out about this concept of tend and befriend. Um, so this notion that for, for females from this evolutionary perspective, it would be less beneficial, there'd be less adaptive value if you're holding an infant or a child or a caregiver to try and fight. Uh, so you try to um, buffer by being more socially connected. And so I don't know if, again, this this particular article is related to tennis. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not quite a bear and you're not fighting for your life. But it is interesting to see how some of these evolutionary perspectives are still there. Yeah, I agree. I think if men were holding babies during tennis matches, they would probably have <laughs> less unforced errors. Yeah, right. I agree. I'm with you on this. Right. I, I see what you're doing there, Head mm-hmm. yeah. mm-hmm. Here, here. Yeah. Here, here. Yeah. Any more thoughts about this story? Well, <laughs> well we had a, a very um, unserious quip that the reason that men make more unforced errors in tennis is because all the best male athletes are playing other sports. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> wrong. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> it's wrong. Wrong. All right. Well, let's move along to our second segment. We want to give this one a bit of time today. And this is the year in review. We do this every year where we look back over the year. We're also soon going to do the best of the year. We're going to have that in an upcoming podcast. But because we haven't seen some of the movies that are just now being released, um, we're going to wait for a week or two before we talk about that. But let's talk about the year in review. I want to ask you a question off the top of your head. Give me a word that would describe the year for you personally, and then a word that would describe the year big picture. So big picture word and a personal word. Um, Who's got that first? Confusing. For you personally or or big picture? Uh, Big picture. Probably for both. (laughs) Uh Because I'm (laughs) stupid. Thanks. All right. What would you say? What would you say personally? Personally, I would say exciting. All right. Why is that? Well, I successfully defended my doc. You know, I finished my PhD, <laughs> defended my dissertation. It sounded um, like you didn't know what you had done. I know. <laughs> I know for a second. I, I was like, what have I done? spoke. <laughs> um, I used my English. Um, no, yeah, I, I've, you know, finally seen some fruit from all of these years of labor, um, which was exciting and, um, you know, I've had a lot of, you know, weird things that have just happened in the past that I feel like have settled. Um, So it's just been exciting. I'm I'm optimistic about the future. All right. Frank, how about you? I would say for me personally, the word is improved. And in terms of the big picture, uh, uh, not quite despair. No, it would be disgust. That's it. The word is disgust. So it's not the other way around? No. It, uh, it depends on <laughs> what un- day un- it is and what time it is. <laughs> so, Frank, uh, improved. You, you think the, your word for the year is that you have personally improved? Yes. You've become a better human? Uh, maybe. Oh, yeah? But improved, yes. How, how so? I learned a lot while I was away, and I have boundaried off social media. I'm not on it nearly as much, and I deleted quite a bit of it. And I'm knowing how to say no and where my limits are. So it's been good. All right. We'll see. 
Jonathan, uh, help. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Holy uh, smoke. Uh, good for you, okay. Frank. Now, uh, let's go with disgust. I'm really oh, happy right. for you. <laughs> Time will tell. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> let's start an office pool when we think Holy the crash smokes. is going to come. Uh, all right. Jonathan, how about you? Uh, personally, it'd be hectic. I mean, my daughters, as they're getting older, I have a middle schooler and a high schooler now. And, they're, you know, they also leave live pretty stressed and busy lives. And it, it's just something that we're adjusting to juggling all of the things they want to be involved in. Uh, and then in terms of thinking about the whole year, I, I would just say surreal. Like, I, 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 you know, in preparation for this podcast episode, I'm, I'm remembering these things that have happened this past year. And two, three, five years ago, if you asked me any of these things happening, I, I would have said, you're crazy or you're describing a fictional television show this this is not reality and and yet here we are here we are the word for me personally would be adventure because this has been a new you know we we moved here in 2016 but really 2017 this is our first full year in a new city that's a really cool new city and it's been an adventure just learning the city meeting new people starting a new business uh all that kind of stuff has been really cool um and then that contrast is the big picture word for me is exhausting. I just feel like this has been an exhausting year on the on the world stage. And it all goes back to Trump, I think, mostly, ultimately. But it just feels like every week feels like a month. You know, like the the it's really fascinating that when you look at these late night talk shows that record Thursday night and then they don't record on Friday. If something happens on after Thursday, they talk about it on Monday. It feels like a month ago. I mean, mm-hmm. that's how much stuff happens now in, in any given like two day period or three day period. So it just feels exhausting. So, um, Emma Kate, let me start with you. Talk about what you feel like are some of the big themes that came out of this year, particularly in pop culture, entertainment, and that realm. Um, I think there's just been a lot of anxiety. Um, everyone, it just felt very doom and gloom at the beginning of the year with Trump's inauguration. And then it really sunk in that he was our president. Um, and then everyone just kind of has this concern and fear about, well, what's going to happen? What's he going to do? Um, and so, you know, there's been this focus on that. Um, Another big theme, though, that I think has come out is this notion of people using their voice. Um, So any kind of change requires one person to start it. And, you know, I'm happy that here at the end of this year, we're ending, in my opinion, on more of a high note in regard to the fact that we have seen this huge empowerment movement with Me Too. Um, so, you know, again, there's a lot of hurt and pain and, um, you know, stress that people have experienced. But to me, I'm trying to, to find the positive here. And, and I think that's a good thing. How about you, Frank? I feel like the theme is increased division. It's, it's just division and um, on a, a certain level, just having to put up some blinders to make it through what's happening. Uh, I mean, even with what Hederly is saying, surreal. Um, I just, uh, I don't know. I, I am looking at the United States in a very different way and in a way I probably never have. I, I, it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not good. I saw Dan Rather on Conan this week, and if you get a chance to watch it, the guy is 86 years old. He is poised as all get out. I mean, we should all be, yeah, you know, 10% as, as poised as that when we're anywhere close to that age. But he said, I've interviewed every president since Eisenhower, I think he said. Uh, I've, follow- I've been in the news business for 70 years, since he was like 16, 17 years old. He said, this is unprecedented. I don't want younger people to think this is just how things go with uh, culture, with the president. This is not, this is not normal. 
So I think what we're feeling to have somebody like that say, look, I've, I've, I've seen presidents for decades, seven decades, and this isn't a normal thing. Um, Jonathan, how about you? Well, and maybe I've just become both numb to, to Trump or nothing surprises me about American politics right now. So the, the things that really stood out to me was the large scale either um, acts of hatred or violence. So I thought a lot about Charlottesville, Virginia and the Nazi rally and how that just turned into this just horrific tragedy that I, again, would never have imagined would happen in 2017 in America. I th- more recently thought about the Las Vegas concert shooting and just the, the, the scope and magnitude of that. And then to, because, of, because it was such a, uh, a public uh, uh, sort of an event of entertainment, there was so much uh, footage and, f- and photos of the event itself and, and just the, the helplessness that uh, the victims and, and the, uh, the witnesses and bystanders. And, and those are things that just, again, I just can't imagine that they're happening, but it is real. It's not a, a plot device in some type of law and order episode or in, in entertainment. It's what's happening in our culture. Yeah, it's hard to believe it. So one of the things that we talked about last episode, which is also in some ways connected to all these different themes, is the Harvey Weinstein story and Me Too and the rise of women in terms of people giving them a voice or listening to their voice. Um, That's a biggie, too. We said last time that we think that's going to have a profound impact, not only on entertainment, but on all kinds of aspects of our culture, from business culture uh, to uh, you you name it. I mean, we'll see it, it in different uh, areas like in Silicon Valley, in the tech field, um, you name it. So um, do you guys see other things like that that are going to have a long-lasting impact, good or bad? Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, ha- I'm having difficulty with some of the things that I cited, having a lot of hope and optimism things will change because especially with the issue of guns, in America, there just seems to be a, an endless gridlock where not a lot tends to happen, um, which makes me incredibly sad, especially when there are examples around the world of countries that have been able to enforce policies that have greatly reduced gun violence. I mm-hmm. uh, the, the one thing I'm hopeful for is that um, millennials and other younger people as well as women are jumping into politics and hopefully jumping more into leadership because the old way of thinking is it needs to die out. We need to, it needs to stop. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what I'm pinning my hopes on. Yeah. My thoughts would be somewhat in align with Frank's in terms of trying to be optimistic in the face of a lot of adversity right now. Um, Just hoping that, we can find our voice, so to speak, again, just making sure that we are being active, that we are taking steps to push and challenge and grow, because right now it just feels like we're all like schmucking through the mud trying to get through to the next year. Because I remember um, at the end of 2016 thinking, oh, God, thank thank goodness 2016 is over. (laughs) Now we can go into 2017, not really knowing what's happening, feeling a little anxious. But then here I am again. I'm just like, oh. Like, let's, let's keep going. We just have to keep moving. So my hope is that uh, we continue to make progress towards change. Well, one thing that I'm optimistic about is that it really people have really stepped up. Rather than mm-hmm. getting very passive in the face of this, you're seeing a lot more activism. Uh, we, we're forgetting the, the uh, Women's March. We're forgetting some of those earlier things. The NFL protests, the, the, um, the groundswell of of uh, movements in, in different ways with the Harvey Weinstein story and the, and the Me Too campaign. Uh, so people really are not just going, like, throwing up their hands and saying, well, this is just how it is. What's, what's fascinating about that, though, is that even with that going on, and again, I don't want to beat this into the ground, but we, we said this a little bit last time, the, the, um, the 
story with um, Me Too being the big, it's, the, it's Time Magazine's person of the year, rightly so. And yet you've got this, this candidate in Alabama who's being, um, you know, the, the very credible stories coming out. And really it's just sort of like, it almost seems bulletproof in that way. And so that's fascinating, just the ability of some just to say, okay, I'm just going to deny, deny, and, and people are still going to going to follow or going to vote or whatever. Um, and Frank, you talked about that being that followership. One, one of the things I would say is there's this, this idea of nationalism, particularly white nationalism, which is different mm-hmm. than white supremacy. Yes. It, it's linked, but it's not necessarily, they're not the same thing. If you want to read an outstanding, it'll take you, you know, 45 minutes or so to read the article, but there's an article in the Atlantic called The Nationalist's Delusion. I would say every person that cares about this stuff should read this article called The Nationalist Delusion in The Atlantic. It's by Adam Serwer. I would love to interview the guy because it's just, I mean, it is, it it lays it all out there for you. Um, So anything else that has really hit you about this year in particular that you want to comment on that either characterizes the year or a particular thing that's happened this year that you think is significant that we just want to make note of? Well, one thing, because we have spoken a lot about the division, but on on a happy note, um, I really thought it was so cool how excited people got about the solar eclipse this year. Like I thought, I remember everyone just felt very amped up about that because it was something that was not political that everyone could be happy about. So I just, I remember that being a lot of fun. Well, especially here in Nashville, because it was, um, it was, we had the, what is it called? The totality. The totality. Or whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. And so we had, we had some friends that we hadn't seen for like 12 or 15 years come in from Miami to see it. We had some other folks from Ohio that were here. We had, we made Chicago style hot dogs. We went out to a park. We had like everybody from the office. It was really, really fun. That was mm-hmm. a total highlight. You're right. Awesome. Anything well, else? Tell- yeah, I'll tell you the, the biggest highlight of my year was uh, on uh, April 16th uh, when the world record was set for 662 Charlie Chaplin lookalikes in Switzerland. That that was beyond that, memorable that for me. For you, huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's there what it tipped is. it. Yeah. Yep. I mean, there were, there was a lot of highlights uh, in the year. I mean, you think back to the beginning of the year. Uh, Moonlight winning Best Picture, and then just even over La La Land. I mean, that's that's something that's going to be remembered for a long time. Mm-hmm. And whether that was really a uh, commentary towards towards Trump and Trump voters, I'll leave it to them to decide. Uh, Chapel Hill National Champions in college basketball. Yep. That was certainly awesome. And, you know, we always complain about Hollywood making crappy movies or crappy sequels. But this year, I mean, they really outdid themselves with sequels like – Resident Evil, the final chapter, or Fifty Shades Darker, or <laughs> Smurfs, the Lost Village, yeah, or things like that. Diary of a Wimpy Kid, the Long Haul, or <laughs> Transformers, the Last Night, or my personal favorite, The Nut Job Two, Nutty by Nature. So <laughs> you know, nutty by nature, <laughs> nutty by nature. So Hollywood, thanks for rebounding after a horrific year of unoriginal sequels. Thank you, remakes. Hollywood. Yes. All right. Well, let's move on, and in our final segment, we're going to talk about something that we've done every year with ShrinkTank.com, and that is give out an award for Champion of Mental Health. And this is someone that has uh, usually a well-known person that is um, either struggling or has struggled with their own mental health issue or has used their platform to advocate for mental health issues. And the first year we gave it to uh, a cast member from Modern Family, a guy named Reed Ewing. We interviewed him and talked. To, he talked about his uh, struggle with body dysmorphic disorder and how he had kind of worked through that. And um, then last year we talked to Lindsay Sterling, who is a um, YouTube sensation. She's a violinist and uh, talked about her own struggles with mental health issues and how she's worked through that. This year, we have six nominees, and the nominees are Pete Davidson, Prince Harry, Rose McGowan, Kesha, and Logic. And we opened it up to an online poll, and the winner was pretty overwhelming. The winner for this year's Champion of Mental Health is 
John Green. John Green is the author of The Fault in Our Stars, and this year the book is Turtles All the Way Down. It is a book about a 16-year-old girl who struggles with OCD, has a great plot, well-reviewed book, and it also parallels John's own personal struggle with some mental health issues, particularly OCD stuff. And so he's kind of putting a lot of that out there using his platform. And he's used his um, his uh, YouTube and Twitter platforms very, very well to advocate for mental health issues um, and things like that. And actually, here's a little fun fact. Um, one of his, a, a movie based on one of his books, Paper Towns, was shot there in Charlotte with you guys. And our own Sean Beck, who's our producer, met him on the set, was on the set with him. So Sean and John Green, they go way back, way back. <laughs> they are so close. They it's are ridiculous. Very, very close. So um, congratulations to John Green about that. And um, Jonathan Hederly, any um, thoughts about just this this bigger award and, and why we do it and what it means? Well, I mean... We really, I mean, Shrink Tank by itself, in and of itself, is really about highlighting the intersection of psychology and mental health in arts and entertainment. And it's a great opportunity to dissect how well popular culture depicts mental health and mental illness, but it's also to, to raise awareness and support those that use their celebrity uh, as a platform for greater support, awareness, breaking down stigma, uh, you know, around mental health, mental illness. The thing I appreciate about John Green the most is that he's able to weave in mental health and mental illness in a lot of his work without it either feeling like a plot device, so very kind of mechanical and awkward. But he, I think he also has avoided some of the, the problems that plague television shows like 13 Reasons Why, where in an attempt to bring greater awareness, they actually open up doors of, of harm and, and mixed results. So it takes somebody that has a lot of sensitivity, um, and, and you, I think you can tell from John Green that, you know, mental health awareness is a huge cause, both in terms of his, his work and in his own personal life. So we really want to champion celebrities that don't just use that platform for their for their own um, merit and and gains but to help other people and I think everybody that was a nominee had a, a phenomenal year in doing that me too and you already mentioned this but John Green is a really good writer he's not just a popular writer he is a popular writer but he's also a very good writer he he draws out great characters he has great plots he um, he his books are consistently good and so for someone that of that level of talent who has such a following and such a voice among young people and older people um it's really awesome that he's uh, kind of put it the, his own issues out there with struggling with mental health concerns but also really advocated for good things in in that field so we're very, very grateful to him, and he is well-deserving of the award of Champion of Mental Health. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of the Shrink Tank Podcast. We hope you'll check out shrinktank.com for great articles and videos, including some information and articles about John Green. We hope you'll follow us on Twitter at shrink underscore tank and like us on Facebook. Our producer and theme music composer is Sean Beck. For Emma Kate Wright, Jonathan Hederly, and Frank Gaskell in Charlotte, I'm Dave Verhagen in Nashville. Tell your friends about us and make it a great week.